Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're going to begin. My name is Michael Cohen. I'm the Communications and Marketing Specialist from the English Montreal School Board. And very proud, once again, to be here at our flagship media education school, Laurie and McDonald High School. So you should all be very proud. Give yourselves a hand, Laurie and McDonald. I've been with the board uh, you know, for 14 years now, and whenever anything comes up regarding media, media education, um, across the country, I'm always bragging about Laurie McDonald. So today, we've got a national broadcast uh, with uh, eight schools across the country participating with, for Media Literacy Week, and we're very happy to host it here at Laurie McDonald. I think it's gonna be a real learning experience. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, Kathy Wing, who is the co-executive director of Media Smarts, uh, to get this program underway. Kathy, thank you, Michael. Michael has been incredible. Thank you for all your help. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, and thank you very much for coming here today. Well, you had to come here today, but thank you for joining in our event. I'm really pleased to be here to celebrate the launch of Media Literacy Week with you uh, and our lead partner, the Canadian Teachers Federation. Our organizations came together seven years ago to launch this week because we feel that media and digital literacy skills are increasingly important life skills in today's rapidly evolving digital world, and especially for young people because you're the most active users of media. And teens spend large amounts of their time nowadays sharing parts of their personal lives online, playing games, posting on Facebook, uh, uploading photos and videos. But despite this openness, we know from conversations we've had with young people that privacy is important to them. With that in mind, we chose Privacy Matters as the theme for this year's Media Literacy Week. And we are encouraging parents, teachers, and community leaders across the country to work with youth to ensure that they develop the knowledge and skills they need to protect their personal information online. So before we start, I have to say a few thank yous that are really important to people and organizations uh, who help make this week possible, and today's panel as well. I'd like to start uh, with those who worked so hard to put this event together, Maureen Barron, Michael Cohen, and Ann Beamish from the English Montreal School Board, uh, UNICEF Canada, who's also a partner, and last but not least, Laurier McDonald School, Luigi Sanatanem, Santa Maria, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, Michelle Leduc, Gina Bergantino, and last but not least, um, Charles Northey and his media students who've taken the time from their busy schedules uh, to put together the questions for today's privacy panel discussion. Thank you all. And of course, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner is uh, one of our key partners as well. Um, and I'll be introducing you to a very special guest from the OPC shortly. I also like to thank the Media Literacy Week sponsors who provide the critical funding necessary for this week's activities to take place. And with special acknowledgement to our gold sponsors, Bell and YouTube, and silver sponsor, TELUS. And all our sponsors, we thank them very much for their support. I'm now gonna turn the mic over to Richard Goldfinch, who's a member of the Canadian Teachers Federation, and is here representing both the CTF and the Quebec Provincial Association of Teachers. Welcome, Richard. Um, to get, bring greetings on behalf of the Canadian Teachers Federation. Uh, we represent nearly 200,000 teachers across the country. I'm the president of the Quebec Provincial Association of Teachers. That's close to 7,000 teachers here in Quebec that teach for the English school boards. And I'm here on behalf of Paul Taifer, the president of CTF, who right now is in Africa working with the teacher colleagues over there. And he asked me to stand in for him for today. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and accepted his invitation with delight, actually. Uh, media Literacy Week is a time to celebrate and examine the influences of all media on our daily lives. For over decades, CTF and Media Smarts have been promoting the importance of media literacy in the schools. You guys are all aware of that, that media literacy is part of what you do here. Um, I heard your teacher's name mentioned, and some of you are from his class. Um, I taught at Alexander Galt High School, and uh, we had two uh, courses going in media literacy, um, and the kids then, talking eight years ago, loved it, so I'm sure you guys are enjoying it too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this year's theme about privacy issues. 
Uh, given that 88% of you are online, it's important. Um, the internet, your virtual neighborhood, um, it is your playground. It's where you guys call the shots. And so we know all too well that some of you are actually extremely savvy when it comes to the internet and to social media and online activity. So this is why we believe it's important to remind you and actually to have the conversation about privacy issues. Um, addressing privacy issues is more than just following basic rules like you, know, you don't give out your full name or your address or phone number, social insurance number, or credit card information. It's also about protecting yourself against identity theft and intrusive marketing tricks involving cookies and beacons. So, as teachers, we want to make sure that your online experience is safe and enjoyable, not an experience that endangers your privacy and personal well-being. And more important, actually, this morning, I really want to thank uh, the people from the Privacy Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Um, they work very, very closely um, with CTF and um, with teachers, and so I want to thank you for always looking out for Canadian children, uh, youth, and even us old folks. Uh, thank you for developing valuable educational tools uh, that help us as teachers help the students better protect themselves. Uh, special thanks and kudos to Media Smarts uh, for your steadfast focus on media literacy, um, for your sound research uh, that helps us as teachers work better also with the students. And on behalf of all teachers in Canada, thank you to all of you for making privacy matters an important issue. Have a wonderful day. Since taking on the role of Privacy Commissioner of Canada in 2003, Jennifer Stoddard has worked tirelessly to raise awareness among Canadians of their privacy rights. Commissioner Stoddard is particularly interested in educating young people about their online privacy and has had many efforts in this area, including a youth privacy website, youthprivacy.ca, which I encourage you to visit, a blog, a video contest for high school students, teaching modules, which we'll be speaking about today, and as the Globe and Mail newspaper noted, she must be the only regulator in the world that has posted a children's video on privacy rights on YouTube. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Jennifer Stoddard, Canada's Privacy Commissioner. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Uh, je suis évidemment enchantée d'être ici ce matin pour lancer la semaine Éducation Média 2012. Je suis particulièrement heureuse du thème de cette année qui est, comme on vous a dit, « Le respect de la vie privée, ça compte ». Today, privacy and media literacy are inseparable, but this wasn't always the case. For example, when my own kids were growing up in Montreal, some 27 plus or minus, 29 minus years ago, Media literacy was mostly concerned with how media and advertising content could affect how young people viewed the world and themselves. So your kid was sitting in front of the TV and you worried about the ads that were being shown at the same time the cartoons were being shown. We're far beyond that now. Media has evolved along with technology. It's no longer one way, it's interactive. Said another way, mass media has given way to social media. So when it comes to media literacy today, all of you out there are not just the audience, but as you know yourself, you are the script writers and you are the actors. You're not just being watched, you're also watching. Advertisers not only seek to influence you, but to learn as much as possible about you and even to track you. And this same interactive revolution that's happening in the advertising world has now happened with video console games. When my kids were playing video games decades ago, a console was just a box connected to a joystick and to a TV. Today, however, as you probably know already, the box that's connected to your TV is also connected to a network of other consoles around the world. Et ce réseau vous permet de télécharger des films, de naviguer sur le web en même temps. Lorsque vous jouez un jeu vidéo, vous pouvez communiquer en temps réel avec les autres joueurs. Certains d'entre eux seront peut-être des amis que vous connaissez dans la vraie vie, alors que d'autres ne seraient que des amis virtuels que vous aurez rencontrés en ligne. 
Les annonceurs savent que bon nombre d'entre vous raffolent des jeux vidéo. Ils essaient donc de pénétrer dans vos mondes virtuels pour promouvoir leurs produits et pour en savoir le plus possible à votre sujet, et ce, dans le but d'augmenter leur vente. C'est sans parler des pirates informatiques qui savent que chaque nouveau compte créé par les joueurs se rattache, comme Richard a mentionné, à un numéro de carte de crédit sur lequel ils aimeraient beaucoup mettre la main. So for all these reasons, because all of the stuff that's behind the video games, that's involved with the video games, that has implications for you, your identity, and your pocketbook when you play video games now, that in, for this year's Media Literacy Week, we've launched new guidance. It provides gamers of all generations with helpful information to make sure that when you play a video game, you're not playing with your own privacy. So I encourage everyone here to read it. To cut a long story short, I think there's a lot of helpful hints about how you can protect yourself. Just go to the website of the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, www.privacy.priv.gc.ca slash video games. And if you can't remember that, as obviously you can see, I can't remember that very often, just Google Privacy Canada and you'll be able to find it. So thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, at my office, we try to be practical, to give you tools you need so that you can participate in this wonderful online world, but you can participate on, with it without being bullied, without using financial information, without losing your identity, without having things happen to you will come back to haunt you 10 years from now. When you're graduating from law school, you're graduating from medical school, wherever you want to be, you don't want to leave a trail on the internet that's going to compromise your future. For, so for all of that, make sure you take care of your privacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Stoddard. We commend the OPC for their really important work in raising awareness among Canadian youth of the privacy issues they need to know about and need to understand when they go online. We're now going to move to the main event, our panel discussion on youth privacy. So as you probably know, there is uh, right across the hall, the CLC room, uh, where Mr. Northey's class uh, has gathered. Uh, they've been busy putting together questions. I think there are some students here that might be leaving us to, uh, to go and join that group. And for the first time ever, I believe it's going to be broadcast into this room, which is pretty exciting. Um, so what's happening is the, uh, the panelists will answer questions from the students at this school, but also we have uh, eight other schools across the province that are joining in. Unfortunately, you can't, uh, I'm not sure if you can see them all, but we just wanted to show you that they're spread across the province, and they actually had to turn a lot of schools away because uh, to get good quality, they had to cut it off at, at nine schools. So uh, those people that didn't get to participate will be able to go on YouTube and watch the panel on YouTube uh, later this week. So I'm going to turn this over to the moderator of today's panel discussion, who will introduce you to our panelists. Our panelists are from Google Canada, uh, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, and the University of Ottawa. Uh, and our moderator for today is Tanya Kriviak. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with Tanya. She's a Concordia University journalism graduate. She worked for CBC Radio and Global TV before moving to CTV Ottawa. And her next challenge will be taking over On Your Side, a new segment featuring investigative and consumer reports. So, over to you, Tanya. Well, welcome everybody to Laurier McDonald High School. I'm going to speak a little louder. Sorry for the guys in the room here with us, but so that makes sure everybody can hear us. My name is Tanya Kriviak. I'm with CTV Television, and it's my pleasure to be here today with you guys. I want to say hi to everybody watching and listening to us. Hi, guys. <laughs> uh, this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to keep the intro very short. Uh, we've got our panel of experts here, though they didn't want me necessarily to call them experts, but that's what they are. They're here to answer your questions. We've got a list of prepared questions. When I call your name, you just stand up and ask your question. If anybody in the remote locations, once in a while, I might throw out and see if you guys have questions. You'll have to put your hand up and I'll coordinate with Gina in terms of you guys being able to ask your questions, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so the people who are on our panel with us today are Colin McKay, he's with Google Canada. What a cool job. He's the manager of public policy for Google Canada. 
We also have Daphne Guerrero. She is with uh, the, she's the head of the public education and outreach at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Also cool job. And Trevor Milford is a student. He's doing his master's in criminology at the University of Ottawa, which is a really interesting topic, something that I'm very interested in as well. So I, we're going to open the floor to the questions because I think we only have about half an hour, so we want to keep this uh, fairly tight. If one of the experts or one of the panelists are saying something that you'd like to follow up on, just give me a sign that you want to ask a question and then we'll you know, stand up and you guys can ask the question away. We want it to be sort of informal. We want you guys to learn as much as you can and not be afraid to ask your questions. Does that work for everybody? You guys over there watching? Make sense? All right. <laughs> We're going to start with Aldo. You can you please stand and read your question? Thank you. All right. Uh, should I worry about how many co how companies can directly target me with ads based on what I do online? Who's the first one to answer that? I think I'll answer that first. Um, companies don't directly target you. What they want to do is give you good ads that a try to answer your question, but they're not looking for you. They're looking for people like you. So there's there's a worry about how your behavior online may be tracked or may be used, but it's not specifically because they're looking for Aldo. It's because they're saying there's a bunch of people like Aldo that could be our customers that might like our product, whether it's video games or clothes or music or whatever. So the attempt there is to try and give you a service. But I'll jump in there and say that there, you should be concerned to the extent that these companies still want information about you, even though they don't necessarily want to identify you. And increasingly, that's ha we're seeing that happen more and more. And so what citizens need to be able to do, what you guys need to be able to do, is understand that companies are looking for more information about you, and they're using that information to make very important decisions about you. Who are your friends? What kind of music do you listen to? Who are you going to vote for? And this is why you need to, this is why our office exists in order to, um, to educate young people, actually all Canadians about this, um, to ensure that you have, you feel empowered to take control over your own information and do something about it. Does anybody have a follow-up question to that? Anybody want to add anything? You know what we forgot to do was I forgot to actually let them introduce themselves. So I'm going to do that now. This way you know exactly who you might want to ask your question to if you have a follow-up question. So we'll start with Colin. Okay, hi, I'm Colin. I work for Google. Google also means uh, Google Search, Gmail, YouTube, Blogger, and a bunch of other things I'm sure you've heard of and haven't seen. And uh, my job is to work with Canadians and work with the Privacy Commissioner and Media Smarts to help initiatives like this, digital literacy, digital citizenship, and help people understand how our products can help make their life better. And I'm Daphne Guerrero. I work at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. A few minutes ago, you just heard my boss, the Privacy Commissioner, speak. I work in her office, and I, along with uh, my colleagues, help to create interesting ways for people to think about their privacy so that, as I had already mentioned, you can take more control over your personal information and what happens to it. Hey guys, I'm Trevor. I'm a master's student in criminology at the University of Ottawa. I specialize in online risk and social networking, particularly cyberbullying and privacy risks. So my goal is to sort of get to the bottom of cyberbullying, figure out exactly what cyberbullying qualifies as, and how we can all work together to sort of generate awareness and empower ourselves to do what's right about cyberbullying. We're going to move on to question number two here. Matthew B. Okay. Uh, some, people, some people cyber bully because they think they're anonymous. Can you ever be totally anonymous online? Yeah, I, I would say no, you can never be totally anonymous online. When you're posting on someone's Facebook wall, your friends know who you are. When, when you stand up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I was saying, there's no way to be fully anonymous online. If people can tell who you are from what you post. Uh, maybe your friends know who you are. Maybe friends of your friends know who you are. Maybe people can tell by your writing style what you're saying. Um, when you're bullying someone, they, they use the term bullying loosely, but you're usually using personal characteristics that maybe only you would know about them. So I think it's important to think about how we're never really anonymous online and anything we say could come back and be reflected personally as something we ourselves do. 
you mentioned about sort of getting down to what is cyberbullying exactly like? Is there a clear definition of what it is? I was actually asked this identical question the other day by a reporter from the Montreal Gazette, and um, <laughs> her her question was, is is cyberbullying just that sort of outright harassment on someone's Facebook wall? And my answer to her was no. It can be a lot more subtle than that, right? You can. I told her that it's any time you disclose someone else's personal information in a way that they don't intend for it to be disclosed. So maybe you, you take drunken pictures at a party and you post photos of them online and you tag someone in that picture without their consent. Um, things like that. So it, responses to that are asking people's permission before you tag them in photos, not posting incriminating content online as a form of revenge or to get a laugh from someone because it could have real consequences for their future employment. Um, things like that. Just thinking critically, would someone want me to be posting this online? So it's not just bashing someone or making fun of them online as part of like under a persona. It's not just that. But like you said, there's you're just using people's using people's information and just in a way that they wouldn't want to disclose. So you can do that too. Exactly. I, I personally would qualify that as cyberbullying for sure. Anybody else have a follow-up to that? Anybody at the other locations? A question about cyberbullying? Okay. We're gonna go on to Sarah Rose, please. Hi. Are there differences between boys and girls in to online privacy? I think um, we've seen research that definitely shows that boys and girls do different things on the internet. Um, girls tend to be more sociable. They chat more with their friends. They share pictures and video. Um, and I think there is certainly a connection there to um, between what they do and their online privacy. Um, if they are sharing more information, more about themselves and more about their friends online, it certainly is going to have an impact. On, uh, on what's private and what's not. And I'll just back that up by saying that's what we see in practice, is that across all types of services, there is a different behavior. There's the same sort of common community morals that should underlie all your behavior, but you behave in different ways. Is that the same case with some of the cyberbullying or some of the research that you've seen? Yes, yeah, so uh, there's some different expectations as to what's appropriate online behavior. A lot of the girls that we've interviewed, um, they tell us that when girls go online and talk on people's Facebook walls, they can sort of get away with more than a guy could. So a, a guy, if a guy goes on someone's Facebook wall and starts uh, saying negative comments about someone, that's going to be perceived as completely uncalled for, whereas if a girl does it because girls use the internet more communicatively, it's going to be considered more normal, right? It's going to be considered more acceptable when really it's maybe, maybe equally as harmful if both genders do it, it's just not generally perceived as such. Yeah. Yep. Um, hearing all these stories with girls mostly, do you think girls are more at risk of like letting the privacy loose on the internet? I think everyone is at risk of privacy invasions online. I don't think just because you're male it, it makes you immune from privacy invasions on the internet. I think maybe there's different kinds of privacy invasions that you have to be more concerned about if you're a girl because your use of the internet is a little different than a guy's use of the internet. So it's the same Yeah, both genders definitely have to be concerned about privacy. Did somebody have a follow-up to that? You said it would still have to work if you put yourself on private and then you would leave your account. Would everything still be seen on Facebook even if you're on private? Uh, that's a good question. I know if you start out with a public profile, that stuff is out there, right? That that can be found. And even if you're on private, people who have access to your account can show it to other people, people they know. People can still creep you when you're not around, when maybe friends are clustered around their laptop. They can. I, I, I think private is a little bit of a misnomer. Private just means more limited access as opposed to private. Any other questions here? Any other questions from uh, the other locations, the other schools? Does anybody have a question? Okay. We're going to go to Lucky now, please. Okay. What if people were aware of privacy at a young age? What would be the difference? I think people are aware of privacy at a young age. I have a, I have a three and a half year old at home, and he already talks about privacy. So I think, <laughs> I think they're. 
I think young people are attuned to the, to the concept of privacy at a very young age, but I think what is different now, um, and what's been said already on this panel, is that um, online privacy is very different than offline privacy, because what does go online is easily shareable, easily reproduced, and easily spread within a matter of minutes, seconds even. Um, and, and that's the concept that I think people need to better wrap their heads around, and certainly at younger and younger ages. Do you think people tend to forget that? Like, you know, they're going, they're posting, they're writing stuff. Like, do you guys always think of that when you're going online? Is that something that's at the forefront of your minds, or? No. Not always. Not always. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody over there? Like, when you guys are going on Facebook or you're tweeting stuff, do you think about your privacy when you put stuff out there? Anybody else have to follow up there? Yeah? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, all of you speak a lot about how things that you post on other people's walls and tweets and stuff like that is all very accessible, but what if you do something private, as in email or inboxing? Is that is that accessible as well? Well, Email and text messages can still be shared by the people that you send them to. So in, in that sense, they're still permanent, they're still easily reproducible. Um, unlike, say, um, a paper letter that you know you could send to somebody and then they could burn it, and then it really is gone forever. <laughs> How many of us still get letters? Yeah. <laughs> Just want to. Um, I also wanted to add to that. Um, I've, I've got some family members that are in kind of higher up corporate positions, right? So if I email, say, my father, and there's something sensitive in that email, maybe his company has a. They, they, they're surveilling what I send my father, right? So even if I send him a private email, other companies that people work for can maybe also have access to that. Oh, so. Anybody else? Any questions here? Yeah. Um, saying that everyone else has access to my emails. For example, where I work, they send me my schedule as well as my email. Am I in danger with that? As well as my paycheck, sorry. They, they send me that through email. Am I in danger with that? You're not in danger if they're sending it to no, you. No, but like, what it is, it's not private afterwards, right? If they're sending it to you and you're the only person getting it, then it's private. Your, your worry is when you're sending emails to, to other people, you always have to think about what you're sending because especially as a teenager and as a young person, you know, you, you're never quite certain what your friends are going to do and what people you don't like are going to do, and they may decide to print something out and share it. But in your case, if it's just one to one, then you can make a reasonable assumption that it's safe. Any questions from the uh, other schools? Okay, we'll go to Alex. Um, as media and public concern rises in response to the horrible recent events like Amanda Todd's suicide, which had probably sparked this interest, a lot of questions are going to have. This is a three parter. <laughs> and this is more towards the privacy commissioner and uh, Mr. Trevor. Um, how can teens control their online privacy? And is there even such a thing as online privacy? As, as, if, as much as you said, a lot of things are easily accessible to everything. And is cyberbullying a crime? I just, did everybody hear that question? Does everybody hear it? No? Okay, you know what? When we ask the questions, can you guys, when you read your questions, can you just speak a bit louder, please? You just want to repeat the three sure. questions? Alex? Uh, how can teens control their online privacy? Is there even such a thing as online privacy? And is cyberbullying a crime? Did that work? Did you hear it? Thumbs up. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll tackle that first part of the question. Um, I think there's a lot young people can do to protect their, their privacy online. Um, the first thing is, is to be aware of the privacy settings on the sites that you use, just social networking sites, websites that you frequently visit. Um, consider who your friends are on social networks. Do you actually know these people in, in real life, or are these people, or, or is this somebody that you've never heard of, never met? Um, and, and if they are, then consider why you would even want to accept them as friends. Um, Think before you click is something that, that uh, we tell young people all the time, and I think that's a, a really important um, piece of advice. Uh, remember that when you put something online, that it is it can potentially be there forever. It can potentially be shared with all of your friends and your family. Um, so so consider that before you 
before you post information about yourself, but also about your friends online. I think that's uh, that's another really important piece as well, is while you want to protect your own privacy, you really should be respecting the privacy of the people around you and, and to consider them when you're when you're doing things online. Yeah, I, I think you made an excellent point. It's about being critical about what you're disclosing online. Don't don't just scroll through a privacy policy and blindly click accept. Actually take the time to read it. I know it's a it's a hassle, it's time consuming, it's not something that's fun to do, but it's, it's something that I think is really important to do. Um, as far as is cyberbullying a crime, I think it really depends on your the way you conceptualize cyberbullying, right? In the case of like Amanda Todd, something that cyberbullying can sort of make the transition into something with real life criminal, kind of a real life criminal context, right? Um, but the thing is, a lot of our criminal law hasn't really caught up with our technologization, if you will. Um, so a lot of the policies don't really mesh with our online environment right now. So some of it does, some of it doesn't. Another good example is sexting. Um, I, I know a lot of jurisdictions are using child pornography laws to govern sexting and we have to ask ourselves if that's a good response to that or if we maybe need new procedures and new laws in place that better conceptualize what we're looking at. So could you say that it would only, that cyberbullying would only be a crime if there are actual real life repercussions? I would say currently your best legal argument against cyberbullying would be if there is an actual real life thing because we can't really it's difficult for us to criminalize internet crime because it's hard to prove, right? Thank you. And just to follow up on Trevor's point, which is that you should pay attention to the services you're using, and that means reading that really boring terms of service, that, that page that comes up on your website, or this little small screen that shows up on your app that tells you what they want to do with your information and how they're going to create an environment for you. Because while all your friends may be on Facebook or they may be on Twitter, um, you can always make a personal decision how you use those tools. And if you learn what those tools will do and what sort of protections they give you, you can control how you communicate online while still talking to your friends. You know, you don't just have to sign up and use it the way they've set it. Make sure that you set it the way it creates an environment where you feel safe and you think that your communication is secure and private. Any other questions on that topic? We have a question at Gerald McShane. Okay, go ahead. Go to the mic. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I, I remember that, so my example is you go on Twitter, Twitter and then you like uh, post something and then you want to delete it. Well, will it still be on the computer? It depends how you posted it. So if your profile is protected on Twitter so only your friends can see it, then all your friends will be able to see it. If your Twitter, if your Twitter account is completely public, then a record of it will exist for a while in the memory of computers. Eventually it will disappear, but it will exist for a little while longer. It won't disappear the second you press delete. Okay. Mark, will you pull for your question as well? We have one more question. Okay, perfect. perfect. And everybody can hear us, right? Our questions. Yes. Are, okay, yes. perfect. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, let's say your account gets hacked on uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever uh, other uh, services. Is it possible that uh, people can know whatever your uh, like anything you know? Can they know if they hack it? Can they know anything they want? If they hack your account, they can know anything they want to find that you've shared on your Facebook account. So if your Facebook account is hacked, or any account, Twitter, whatever, then the first thing you do is you change your password to something much, much stronger. And then you go and you make sure that you've checked whether or not the person who hacked your account has sent any messages or made any wall posts or sent any tweets that you want to delete. And then you contact your friends and tell them that your account was hacked, and that's why it looked really, really silly for a while. Does anybody else want to add here from the panel? No. I think. Hang on. I think there was a question from Parkdale. Parkdale. Yeah. 
Yes, definitely. There's a question. It's, it's more of a, of a administrative uh, question. I just wanted to know how liable teachers and administration officials are uh, when it comes to cyberbullying and um, that kind of um, attacks on children. Because, like, should we be more and more aware of what's happening? Because we can't control the kids' lives at school, but if we're made aware of it, then how liable are teachers and people who work with kids um, in order to bring this up to the police or to whoever? Okay, who can answer? Or? Yeah, I think the question of liability is a, a really sort of a tricky question when you when it comes to cyberbullying. I think if we're all paying attention to issues involving cyberbullying, and if we're all sort of empowering ourselves to be aware and sort of take notice of what's happening, educate the children about cyberbullying and why it's not okay to share other people's personal information in ways they don't approve of or why it's bad to harass people online. I think sort of making that, that educative attempt is probably the best step in taking your own responsibility in the liability. I don't, don't know if you could necessarily be held liable by the police for someone being cyberbullied, but I think it's everyone's responsibility to make sure that people are educated. We're going to take a question now from Paula. Hi. Um, what if a teen were to post something that would violate their online privacy and when forced to deal with the repercussions, claims that they didn't know about the Privacy Act? Would ignorance be uh, lead to a less severe punishment? Do you mean if, uh, if somebody posted something online about yes. another person? Yes. Um, well, the, the privacy law is, is uh, meant to apply to um, to instances where there's there's a commercial transaction. So in this instance, I think it's it's more really a question of, of uh, what's appropriate and what's right. And if you are posting something um, that could be hurtful to another person, or even without their per that person's knowledge, it's, it's, it's not really an appropriate thing to do. I mean, in the realm of digital citizenship, it's, not, it's just not cool. Um, that other person uh, could go to the original poster and ask that person to take it down. Um, and, uh, and if that person refuses to take it down, that person could then go and, and speak to the, the service provider to see if something could happen. Does anybody else want to add to that? Okay, we'll, we'll take a question now from Victoria G. Hi. Uh, what should kids be looking for in privacy and usage policies on social networking sites? They should be looking for um, information that tells them what in, what information is being collected and how it's being used and for how long it's being kept. Um, and they should also be looking for uh, ways to contact that company if they feel that their information is being misused. I think it's I, I think ultimately it comes down to an issue of control. You want to be able you 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 should know how your information is being used. Your personal information, everything about you, is very valuable. It's not only valuable to these companies um, to use it for marketing purposes or, or whatever, but it's valuable to you. And so before you give that information up, you should know what you're getting in return and also what the company could be getting out of the transaction as well. I have a sort of to follow up. It, the, the language that they use, though, is it very clear for the kids? Do they know, you know, what's what's being asked of them or what the info is? Like, are there certain words that they should be looking for that they should say, "Uh oh, mm -hmm. that's not good." <laughs> well, I don't think they we're at a place in developing privacy policies in these contracts where it's up to the companies to develop clear policies that explain to you whether it's on a computer, on a phone, or on a tablet what information they would like you to share and what they'll be doing with that. So hopefully we're entering into a period where you'll see simpler explanations of what's going on, what's happening with information, and what sort of resources you have available. And I would say that one, one of your defaults now should be if you look at a privacy policy and it's too complex and you don't understand it as an educated adult, um, what, what it means, then you should probably think twice about using that service because it's up to the service to provide you with that information. 
anybody else want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, because a lot of privacy policies are not written in youth-friendly language, if you're having trouble understanding something, that's not an excuse just to scroll through the policy and click accept, yeah. like I said before. Like, don't, don't be afraid to ask a parent to explain it to you, ask an educator to explain it to you. That's, that's why your teachers, that's why your parents are there, to provide clarity to you if you're having trouble understanding something. So an adult can maybe help you out if you're having difficulty understanding something in a privacy policy. You can also ask the service provider. I mean, the privacy policy should also include contact information for somebody at that organization that you can you can contact with their question with questions. This was really interesting, but our time is, is up, so we have to say sorry and thank you everybody for taking part. Thank you to our panelists. A big round of applause. Thank you everybody watching over there. I hope that you all got some of your answer your questions answered. And I don't know if anybody, you know, I don't know if you guys are available, maybe if some people still have a couple of questions that they can come see you for. And I just wanted to say thank you to Lori McDonald here, Lori McDonald, for hosting this event. I think it's a great, uh, great idea. Media Swartz, who also is in charge of uh, Media Literacy Week. So thank you to everybody who participated. And uh, I hope you're going to have a better sense of how to protect yourself when you're online now, when you're using all these sites. Thanks, guys. Woo!